All right, so first thing we're talking about is engaging our audience or engaging your audience as a marketer. Um, we kind of got, we've kind of gone over some of this stuff. So I've just wrote down some notes that I thought were important to reiterate or just to go over again. So as you are marketing your film, you want to be sure to dedicate time to engage with your audience. You want to answer questions that they have, thank them for commenting. If they say a joke, build off that joke or playfully tease them back. Be sure to interact and engage with your audience and you'll be able to maintain a more engaged and active audience. Before you start a marketing campaign or before you ramp it up to full speed, consider creating all or the majority of the content you'll use to promote the film for your company before you start. Doing this can help you have a plan for when and what you'll post, what your content can be, and help you strategize the campaign. Are there any holidays in between the start and end of the campaign? Even the really small ones like National Cookie Day, Popcorn Day, and et cetera. If so, how many or how might you be able to use that day to maybe help promote your film and campaign? Obviously, if National Pan Popcorn Day is there, you can relate that to theaters or movies and then relate that to your film. But you want to be to consider how you might be able to use holidays and events to tie into your marketing, to make it more active and feel like it's um, happening more in real time instead of pre-planned. You don't want it to feel pre-planned. You want it to feel like you are active with your, with your marketing and your engagement with the community that is following it. Another and perhaps more important reason to pre-create your content is that it will leave you the time to interact with your audience once you begin posting and marketing. If you're creating as you go, it makes it a lot harder to communicate and contact the people who are commenting, answer their questions and reply to them and talk with them because you're busy trying to make the next thing for your campaign. But if you've already had it done, you already made it, then you have the chance to use that time that you would have used creating the content to um, engage with the audience and be more active and get them to open up and interact with you more, which will make them more connected with you and your company or your film or whatever it may be that you're marketing. You also want to create engaging content for your audience. What that content is that engages them is going to be different for everybody. As, you spe as your specific target audience won't be exactly the same as others. What does your audience like best? Short polls, long stories, questionnaires, clips, et cetera. You have to find what they like most and utilize those things to interact with them. You also want your audience to engage with you and with each other. What might maybe cause a debate or a back and forth conversation in the comments? The more comments you get, the more active it is. Social media likes activity likes, comments, shares, comments, back and forth. So that's more engagement, which means they think people are actively looking at this content and they're gonna spend a lot of time on it. So they show it to more people and that can help build your audience and help the social media algorithms share that with other people when they otherwise wouldn't have, just because two people might be commenting back and forth a lot. So it's like, oh, this thing got you know 10 comments instead of this thing only got one. So you want there to be back and forth. You want there to be a lot of comments and using something that might be a debate can definitely start bringing people's opinions in. And when people want to have their opinion known, they might go back and forth talking with someone else about it, maybe even get into an argument or just a debate about it. Um, How you also want to think about how you might be able to get your audience to like it, to share it, to retweet it, subscribe, follow, comment, etc. You have to create engaging content unique to your audience for one, which is much easier said than done because, first of all, you have to know who your target audience is to be able to know what kind of content they want to look, they want to look at. You can also specifically ask them to do these things like asking them to like and share, please retweet, follow for more content like this, subscribe to see all of our future content. What do you all think? Comment below. 
Sometimes the most engaging content is asking for someone's opinion. Our friend or developer producer thinks blank camera is better than blank. We think otherwise, who's right? If people like cameras, they might go back and forth talking about why they like one over the other. And that could make the social media algorithms spread that one debate throughout its um, platform. Yeah, you wanna make sure that it's always a, like still focused on your project and not doesn't just turn into random conversation or even fights or, you know, take it, focus on, okay, let's, this is camera use or this is the production or this is something cool. Um, and try to make it engaging, like ask a question and that way you'll get more engagement and more engagement equals, you know, they're going to share it more too because the algorithms will want to share in more places because they're like, oh, this is getting a lot of comments or shares or likes or whatever. Right. And you can also use the debates to kind of get some idea of what your target audience might like, like um, something that will help you. Are theaters worth it? Or how often do you guys go to the theaters? You know, something like that. Yeah, I, would, I would say don't say our the don't word it like our theater is worth it. Word it in a very neutral way where it doesn't sound like you're one way or the other, just like open. And also like, hey, what what is your um I suck at this, you know I suck at this. But like, um, how often do you go to theaters? Or what kind of films make you want to go to theaters? But the thing is it depends on your audience because they might not be. If, you try, if you're asking somebody, are theaters worth it, that is more um, oh, yeah. controversial. So that means that people might comment more because they're trying to either stand up for it or they're trying to be oh, like, Oh, you're talking about in the context of like sharing distribution. What? You're talking about in the context of distribution or just? Marketing. Oh, okay. Using your marketing to figure out what does my target audience like? And if most of your people, the majority of your target audience or your fan base are saying, no, it's not worth it, or they'd rather go watch it on a streaming service at home, you may be able to use those details to help influence your distribution strategy later. Um, not always, you know, but if you are having the right target audience follow you, then you, you might be able to find out that information just from making those kinds of posts. And because they're a little polarizing, maybe, or because, you know, people are going to take a stance on it, that might actually create more engagement than just being more neutral but it also depends on your audience. If your target audience doesn't like that kind of one-sided way of looking at things or doesn't want to or doesn't want to follow someone who doesn't like theaters and they take it the wrong way and think that you're asking are theaters worth it because we don't think so even though all you said was are theaters worth it. Like Priscilla said, the wording matters, but it also matters in the way of who your audience is, how they're going to react to it. And sometimes those things, like I said, they're really hard to figure out because you don't really know how people are going to react always. But you can get a general sense by doing all your market research and trying to figure it out um, by looking into what your target audience is usually like, other posts that ask similar questions or go over similar types of things and see um, how people reacted to it. And if those people are in your target audience, you might want to do it one way or the other. It's not just about making people aware of your film or company. You also want to make them interested in it. Creating engaging content and engaging with your fans are great ways to start, maintain, and then grow an audience. It's not easy and it takes a lot of effort, but it's definitely worth it if you can manage it successfully. And the more you build, the better chances you have of creating more content, future projects, because you'll have more of an audience, you'll have more leverage to get funding, you'll have more input and feedback from different things if you need it or want it by asking your audience what they think of your script, what they think of your clip, your trailer, whatever it may be. So you'll be able to improve your craft as you go, having an audience and building it. Um, it also, if you you want to try to do a crowdfunding campaign at some point to raise funds you're not just trying to get it from investors those are all great ways um to great reasons to have a built-in audience and to continue to grow it as you expand and as you continue down further projects in your career
Does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything else relating to engaging with your audience? Um, no, I do. Now, can you can you also use that for the email emailing uh, this, like including surveys? Yeah, yeah, you can include like a survey or a poll or something in your net in your email list or your. Um, <laughs> newsletter and then try to create engaging content through your newsletter as well we're just talking about social media because that way you'll get it to more people like engagement mm. no i i agree with that um newsletters should have should be engaging as well no, to keep as people as well. I just mean interested in following it because you can also have people who just get stop bored, following yeah. the newsletter because it's kind of boring no definitely i just mean that like a lot of people not us sorry a lot of people focus on social media more because it helps you get more people attention but yeah it definitely yeah. shouldn't be ignored um or um overlooked how important it is to keep your newsletter engaging as well because yeah a lot of people do get bored or if they follow multiple things they even forget what is this again why am i following it uh and it's just yeah really it's true interesting or new mm -hmm. or dynamic yeah, so I definitely agree with that. Um, you need to like engaging your audience is one to make yourself relatable by talking to them and making yourself more humanized than just um, somebody posting ads pretty much. Now you're communicating with them, you're talking with them. If they have any questions or like they have any related things that they're going through, you can relate to them and explain something or talk to them back. Um, if, and then if you have an audience, it's engaging with them, helps to retain them, keep them from going and leaving or unsubscribing or unfollowing or stop following the newsletter. And people love to feel like they're a part of something. So if you're asking their opinion or including them in things, they're gonna feel like, oh, this is cool. I'm a part of something, a community or, a, or like my input is valued, or, you know. Right, and then, and then engaging your audience is also especially on social media to build your audience because social media platforms will show it to more people the more engagement it gets, whatever kind of engagement that is, likes, shares, comments, all of that type of stuff will help the algorithms share it to more people because a lot of people are liking this for some reason. A lot of people are commenting. They're spending a lot of time on this post. Let's show it to others. Maybe they'll spend more time on our website. This is what all, all social media platforms want basically is for people to keep staying on there so they see more ads and the social media platforms receive more ad revenue. Oh, okay. But yeah, it's, it's really mm -hmm. important for, for all those reasons to keep retention, to gain new followers, and just to make it interesting and um, be able to communicate with your audience because having an audience isn't just so that people follow you it's also so that you can communicate them and later on utilize them to help get feedback on different things and so yeah i was i was saying that because you know you know i had tried it was i think it was mailchimp and they actually have campaigns like directly you know connected to like their facebook campaign hmm and yeah it's just that i wasn't relative i forgot the name I'll, I'll send you the link later when i when i get it um you know to to the um group okay yeah, it's pretty cool yeah so pretty much we set up the whole campaign and it's uh the the the, the letter it goes out um at certain times like to certain you could you could send it out at certain times of the day and and they have a, it's, it's really, it was just that I just didn't have, I just didn't have enough followers to actually, because you're supposed to like gather all of these, you know, people just to sign up mm -hmm. and, I, and I just couldn't catch up. <laughs> yeah, that's the most getting difficult the, part is getting people to sign up for it. Getting people, yeah. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that's taking an action. So they have to look at your thing, first of all, then they have to be interested enough to go further and into engage. it, clicking that link and subscribing. <laughs> yes. So yeah, it's a Very lot of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's like they, everyone says, you know, if you keep at it, it's a slow build. But eventually, if you keep doing it and you're, you're actually making engaging content, 
um, you're, yeah, you're, that's what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Then your, your uh, audience will start to grow even if just a little, but over time it'll start to be bigger and bigger. And the bigger it is, the, the more potential it has to expand further quicker because now more people can tell their friends or their family or whoever that they think might be interested in it to, um, join in, you know, come join this thing. They're really cool. Mm -hmm. This person's trying to make a film. I've been following him for two years, you know, and the more people that say that, it means there's more chances that other people hear it and go, oh, that's cool. I'll follow them. So it's definitely a huge process though. And it's a lot of effort and work, which is why a lot of people kind of give up after a few attempts at it. Um, you know, so, it, but it is, it, if you can get it going and if you stick at it and it starts to build, it's definitely worth it, especially if you're trying to make later projects. Yeah, and, uh, definitely there. Yeah. I can vouch for that. It's definitely there. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. The next thing we're talking about is press releases. This stuff comes from filmlifestyle.com. It is letter I in the syllabus. A press release is a written document prepared for the media that announces something newsworthy. They are sent to newspapers, magazines, radio stations, TV stations, online media out outlets, and influential bloggers. Their purpose is to provide info on an, an official statement or to make some sort of announcement. The goal of a press release is to share news or story with the press and media to get that news put to print or online and TV. You want publications to report on the news and spread the word to reach a further audience than you could do alone. If you can get the media interested in what you have to say, they will write stories about you and your company or film. You want to write your press release in a way that is interesting and exciting so that they want to write about it. There are different kinds of press releases. Breaking news releases, which are used for announcements that have a hard deadline. Things like, for businesses, it's things like acquisitions and retirements. You know, one of the CEOs is retiring or somebody high up is gonna retire or somebody's about to buy out this company or there's gonna be a merger, things like that. A new product launch and more. Those should only be used when there's actually breaking news in real time and it's going to be distributed immediately. Then there's new product or service launches. They're one of the most common reasons for a brand to issue a press release because they're constantly coming out with new products or branching out to different services in their company. You wanna include all the details about what is new and why it matters. There's new partnership announcements may have a press release, rebranding press releases, whether it's updating the website, refreshing the logo, tagline, or et cetera. If a company's doing that, they will send out a press release describing what they're doing and why the rebranding matters. There's VNR, which is video news release. And they're increasingly becoming more popular and it is a traditional press release with a video or TV news package attached at the end. The idea being to grab a journalist's attention and make them more likely to run the story by including video and pictures that they need to tell it. And that way they can have some kind of visual to help go along with whatever the press release is about. Blog post press releases are designed to be read by bloggers, not traditional journalists. So they need to be formatted in a different way. Then there's event press releases, which are used to promote upcoming events. Unlike a media advisory, which we talked about like a week ago, which is to invite the press to attend an event, to cover it, like go there and actually make a story about it. An event press release is to get the press to run the story to their audience so the public is aware of it. So it's basically just um, the information needed for them to then publish it on their site or their, their magazine or whatever it may be so that people who read that magazine or people who visit that website can see that story and see the details. Whereas a media advisory is never gonna go out to the public. It's gonna be just for the media 
saying, hey, we're doing an event, come to it. A press release is, hey, put this in your magazine so everyone knows to come to this thing. So when you're trying to make an event for the public, you have to do both. Media advisory, because you want to try to get the media to come there and make a story about the event itself. And then the press release so that the media can share it with the public so that you're trying to get people and the public, the general public to come to the event as well. Journalists receive many press releases every day. So to make yours stand out, yours must be interesting and succinct. Attention grabbing headlines and a concise body that answers all the questions a journalist may have. You need to consider your news importance um, and if anyone will actually care about it. Is it something that is actually newsworthy? Not everything is. Is it important? Does it have an impact? Is it interesting? Is it impressive or is it inspiring? For filmmakers, it might be a, a story about how you were able to make a film with a, with a few people or the people that you worked with um, or how you were able to bring together a local company to, or a local um, area to create a film together, or a local church if you're making a, a religious film of some sort, how you were able to go from church to church doing that. So something inspiring like that could be a way to uh, make a press release and try to get the media to report on it. And then also you have um, film releases. When your film comes out, you can make a press release about that. And then also if you are doing a premiere event or any kind of event that's related to your film marketing plan, if you're doing some kind of stunt, um, pub publicity stunt event that you're trying to attract attention to your film um, to pe make people aware of it, then you might want to send out a press release. Well, you definitely want to send out a press release to inform the media, to try to get them to inform the public about whatever event you are doing. There are certain elements in almost every press release. There's a headline, to something catchy, captivating, and to the point, which clearly conveys what the story is about. So in, our, in, this, uh, in this example, they have the AdventureWorks company, I guess, and then the AdventureWorks announces quarterly earnings results. That's the press, what their press release is about. It's about the company's earnings result, results. So that's the headline. Summary, a summary paragraph that gives a clear description of what your story is about. Interesting enough that the reader wants to keep reading. So the summary is this, all this paragraph right here. Opening paragraph, the who, what, when, where, and why of your story. And there's the body copy, which elaborates on all of the points in the summary and opening paragraphs. Press releases are generally under 400 words, so be sure you don't include unnecessary details there. And then there's the boilerplate, which is a quick about section that includes info about your company or you as an individual. And on this, that would be, that's up here on the top left. Some of them do it at the bottom. I don't know if there's a specific format. I know there's a bunch of templates out there and they're all a little bit different. Um, so it might not look exactly like this, but basically they all share the same type of information for the most part. Um, Besides press releases, there's also something called a media pitch, which people sometimes use interchangeably with a press release, but that is incorrect because a media pitch is contacting an individual member of the press or news reporting business and directly asking them or telling them why you have a compelling story and why they should write an article about you. So that's more like asking them to research and write about you, while a press release is giving them the story to share if they choose. They may contact you for further details, but all the main details that they need to write about are already there. Whereas 
excuse me, a media pitch is, hey, I believe your magazine would love to do the story on my film because you write about these other films and it's very much like my story, blah, 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 blah. Here's why. And here's why I think I'd be a great fit for your magazine. I'm trying to get them interested to um, research or come to an event or do whatever, go see the film so that they then write about it. Press release is sending it out to all sorts of different media outlets instead of just directly asking one individual at a time by uh, basically pitching your story of why that media outlet should do it, should make a story about you. Press releases, here's the story, please um, share this with other people in your, in your audience, people who read your thing or whatever it may be. You want to write your press release in third person using an active voice. Keep it short and sweet, be simple and clear. You wanna write it in a way you would write a news story. This next stuff comes from expresswriters.com. It's letter J in the syllabus. Press releases allow a film to spread throughout, to spread throughout. The news of its release date, premiere, and info about the film, director, company, and Oh, the company making it and actors that are in it. It may be worth hiring a professional release, press release writer if you have named actors or crew members, as it will get much more publicity if you can get on some of the bigger publications. And to get on the bigger publications, sometimes you need somebody who knows exactly how to write press releases. And a professional will know exactly what needs to be put in, how to word it, how to make it stick out so that those bigger publications are more likely to pick it up. More people will become aware of your film and in turn, more people will buy tickets to see it. If you're a small independent project without named actors or above the line crew, without a named above the line crew, just like director, producer, if you're all unknowns, consider focusing on smaller, more local news outlets to send press releases to and possibly a media pitch to some of the larger ones. That way you can go in depth in explaining why you feel like your film should be on whosoever platform you're trying to get to. And then the local news outlets that you're releasing to or that you're premiering in or distributing in, um, you can communicate with them because they don't have as many press releases. They don't have as much um, local news going on. So they have less to choose from, meaning yours automatically has a higher chance of getting into their publication or their online release platform or blog or whatever it may be. Press releases for movies have the company name and contact info for the press release agency, date of the press release publication, it can either be immediate or specified for a certain date to release to release the news story. So you could say, you know, we don't want this shared until three weeks from now, but we're sending it in advance to make sure you guys see it and know about it. Or you could say, this is for immediate release, right? When you get this, please post the story. Then there's the press release title, location and date of the press release, which is usually a major city followed by a dash, a date, and a final dash. The press release body, which is the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And then the boilerplate, which is info about the company or related companies if there are multiple companies working on your film. They suggest perking up the press release with clips, production stills, or poster images, just to give a little bit of a, again, a um, visual to go along with the story that you're trying to get them to post. And that way they kind of already have some of the material they could use without having to go in and request if they would like any of that. You always proofread it, double, triple check to ensure spelling and grammar are correct. You want this to look as professional as it can. Misspellings or grammatical errors are going to be a huge turnoff, especially to the bigger publications. 
<clears throat> so be sure to double, triple check and make sure everything is good if you're doing it yourself. <clears throat> Here's another uh, example of a press release. Be sure to target publications that report on film or local events. Don't send it out to a magazine that talks about home improvement unless your film has something to do with home improvement, then you can't. But sending it to a home improvement news store, uh, publication or something that reports on you know, local home improvement or whatever, it's not going to be, it's just going to kind of be a waste of time to send it to them because there's no reason for them to put that in their magazine or their online publication because your thing has nothing to do with home improvement. So why would they? So just like with everything else, make sure that you know who you're sending it to and you target it to the outlets that are in your industry or in your realm or report on something that is um, related to your film or where your film is premiering or where it was made. So local news loves to hear that a film was made in their state or in their in their um, city whereas uh and, and then you know if you're premiering in their in their city that's also local news so local news stories love that kind of stuff and then of course anything that reports on film independent film or whatever genre you're doing that's the kind of publications you want to get to try to release the information especially because they'll have the audience that are going to be interested in seeing it if somebody's going to that home improvement magazine and your film's a horror movie, you know, they might not even like horror movies anyway. So even if they did put it in the publication, it doesn't mean it would help you at all. So definitely research and target it. This next stuff comes from filmsourcing.com. It's letter K in the syllabus. <clears throat> Like I said earlier, think about what about your film or production are newsworthy. If you can't think of anything, then it may not be. Not every film or TV production has to be covered by the media, but you want it to. So try to think of something that is interesting or sets it apart. You know, was there anything interesting on production? Did you have any? interesting crew or actors did you use all local people did you have a super diverse crew did you have a, somebody with a disability in your thing like what might set you apart from others how did you make the film was there any interesting ways you guys went about creating a shot or doing something that was different from everyone else those kinds of things can be interesting and can set you apart or is your film about something that nobody else has reported on or nobody else has done a film on or that's very rare you know, that can be something that sets you apart, definitely. You also don't want to send large bulk emails. Some channels don't want email attachments or others only accept press releases submitted through their website. So if you're just taking a bulk list of emails from different publications and sending it out to all of them all at once, um, they might not even receive it because, or they might not accept it just because it came through email when they state on their website that they need it through their website. They might have a button or a place where you actually submit it on their site. Also, if they do accept it through email, sending bulk emails to hundreds of contacts can make your emails end up in spam folders because the email, whatever email platform you're using automatically thinks that it might be spam because you're sending it to so many people at once. So individually, while time consuming <clears throat> can be a better way to go. Uh, this said immediate release, same as press release. So this is a press release. It is still a press release. It's just saying it's for immediate release. So when the news outlet receives it, this story, whatever story this is, is for immediate release. We want the press to put it in their magazine or put it online as soon as they get it if they choose to post it. Otherwise, here you would say for release on October 30th, you know, if you want it to be right before a certain event, or maybe your premiere is November the next week. And so you want the news to come out shortly before 
but you want to make sure to get it to the press, um, the media beforehand so that they're aware of it and they can decide if they want to report on it or not. Uh, so that's basically just telling them when to release this story. The press can be, they can receive a story weeks in advance or a month in advance before you actually want it to be released to the public. But yeah, so um, sending in bulk emails to hundreds of contacts can make it spam. So you might want to consider sending it individually and definitely check out each platform you're trying to send it to, see their website, see if they are saying that they need it through their website or how to send press releases to them. <clears throat> Many channels have low urgency items mapped out weeks ahead. So if you want a story about an event or a premiere, make sure to give them enough time to schedule it in, but not so much time that they set it aside and forget about it. Smaller online channels usually have a faster turnaround, so you may want to wait a little more for those than larger channels. They also have like certain reminders like a month before, a week before, a day before, you'll set up automatic things. Who? Um, depending on the place you're looking at, the place you're sharing and stuff, you're able to do automatic posts in different, um, in different moments. The, the press release, the, the news themselves? Yeah, like you can set it up. It's like sneak peek a month before, a week before, like to build anticipation and stuff. It's like, hey, we're going to have some big news soon. Oh, you're talking about sending it to the press release or sending it to the press. Is that what you're saying? Or yeah, are you talking yeah, about the like press kinda, itself? Kind of like a sneak peek. Like, oh, there's something big coming. A bunch of movies do that, or a bunch of companies do that. It's like, oh, we have some big news coming this date. But would that be the same as a press release? I mean, it's it's a pre pre press release, isn't it? Isn't there such a thing? I've heard it before. Possibly. Either way, for independent films, I doubt that they would want that um, because your your news is already not as big as a Disney film coming out. Disney might be able to do that, and all the news the uh, platforms would be loving that because they would have more information and they could make a story about it. I mean, I would say at least if you can do at least one beforehand so that the, the largest amount of people see it as possible. Because sometimes because it's a smaller one, when it does come out, some people miss it because of that. It's like, oh, I didn't even know, you know? Yeah, but again, What's going to make the publication want to release a story if it's like we have some news coming and you don't we don't know what company you are we don't know who you are yeah that's true so they're less I'm likely to like and then people, if they're just receiving stuff from you that's saying one week from now we're going to give you the story like social media then? next week we're going to give you the story yeah, yeah social media yeah. you can definitely do that where you're building it up and making a countdown but like sending press releases to news outlets you don't want to spam them because then they're going to just yeah, be like, uh, these people are like, we don't care about your news. You're just, you're nobody. Because right now you are, you're nobody. Why is your thing interesting? So if you're sending out, hey, we're going to give you some news later, they're not even sure if they want your news. So like I said, something like Disney or some like Universal or a big company doing that would probably be fine. I'm not sure if they do that or not. But press releases are more to give them the story so they can choose to release it. It's not to give, the publication itself can do that. It can choose if it wants to say, hey, we have some big news from Disney, but we're not allowed to release it yet. Yeah. If they'd say, if it's not for immediate release, Disney gives them something and says, you know, release two weeks from now on this date at yeah. this time, then they might send out something like two weeks from now, we got some big news about Disney's new film if they want but that's because they want people to come back to their outlet, their news uh, two weeks from now. So yeah, I'm not entirely sure on that, but I would say probably not. Um, but when you're a smaller independent company and you're sending out your, your film, you wanna make it attractive to the news about why it's different, why it's interesting, 
and why they should report on this. But again, you have to think about how far in advance to send it to them, even if you want it for immediate release. If you're sending it to something like um, one of the bigger publications that report on everything, they're getting so much news stories that they have a huge pack, a, st a stack of uh, different stories that they might be able to run. And so they choose what to run that day, or they might even do it weeks in advance, especially if it's a bigger publication. They usually have a, like a strategy. They usually have a schedule of releases that are going to happen and when. Uh, and you want to make sure that you give the bigger outlets, if you're trying to get on them, enough time to go to your story and post it or schedule it in, but then send it out to the smaller, more local places, maybe a little bit of a, with a um, closer to the date that you want it released or closer to when the news is supposed to be. That way it's kind of all coming out at once because by the time the big publication gets to it, the small publication is getting it just like maybe a few days before while the bigger publication you sent it to them weeks ago, but they're releasing it around the same time because they've had enough time to schedule it in. Smaller publications aren't gonna get as many stories, so they have more turnaround. They have a quicker um, decision time of, of posting it or not. Whereas the larger publications, like I said, they're getting so many that they have to schedule it. Otherwise they just bombard everyone with news all the time. Uh, da -da. Like Vish said, you can support press releases with social media so you are more credible. You could um, you could like say that there's going to be a news story on your thing in a few weeks in your social media, your newsletter. And you can say, if, especially if somebody's confirmed that they'll do it and they'll run your story, you could then communicate that to your audience and say, hey, you know, in a few weeks, we're going to have a big story. We'll tell you guys all just, you know, stay tuned. Yeah. Be sure to check back with us in a few weeks, that kind of thing. If you don't know when, consider contacting the writers about it to see when they suggest sending the press release. It's also a good way to start building relationships. This type of stuff is all about relationships with the people. If you have a good relationship with somebody that's um, working at an, a magazine, a film magazine of some sort, or some kind of online film publication, then you have a better chance of them taking your story and running it than if you don't have, if you've never talked to that person before and you're sending it to them and you're a brand new stranger. So consider, plus also you, you wanna know what they think, you know, should I send this to you guys really early or should I wait? You know, when do you guys usually run your stories? Most of them are fine handing out that information and communicating with somebody who's trying to get on their platform trying to give them a story. So don't be afraid to, to ask the writers or ask whoever you can in the company that's running the stories, um, what they think, when they, when they should send it out so that you can be as professional as possible when you are sending your press release. Try sending the press release early in the day and early in the week. Friday, they're gonna be ready to go home and they might not remember your case the next time they're at their desk. You know, they have the weekend off. So even if they plan to do something with it, they might set it aside and then forget about it when, when Monday comes around. So consider sending it earlier in the week. And then uh, the same thing earlier in the day because the later in the day it is, they might not get to it until they're about to go home. And they're like, oh, I'll do that tomorrow and then forget about it. So the less you want that to be uh, less of a case, you want that to be the least, the less, uh, how do I say this? You want that to be less of a chance. So the way you do that is by sending it earlier, obviously. <clears throat> if it's a blogger or a vlogger, then that rule doesn't really apply because they might blog in their spare time. So they might be blogging on the weekend, they might be blogging in, at night, and so you can send it to them. But again, you wanna look up press releases specifically geared towards bloggers or vloggers because they're gonna look different than the uh, more traditional ones like this.
So again, from a press release, they said, um, this is from linkingnews.com. They have film press release template and kind of show an example of what you might want to do. The title, whatever the title is, film exploring the gender gap. So basically that's just what it's about in a really, really succinct way. That's the summary. Um, so you're saying, you know, this is what, it, this film is about this and it's gonna debut here or we're having a premiere event here on this date, something really small. The title needs to be, you know, clear of what this is, film releasing this day or something. Then you have the body, which is what the film is like expanding on the summary <clears throat> from legendary director and co-founder, blah, blah, comes this film, whatever it may be, the upcoming feature length or short film or whatever is a blah, 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 blah. This is what it is. It's gonna premiere here at this time on this date. And then immediately following the premiere, blah, 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 this is gonna happen. CEO, of tech ventures of the documentaries of like conversation, blah, blah, blah. Basically, you're just giving details about what it is and why it's newsworthy and why it's important. The goal of this movie is this, it showcases these things. The film features this, the actors, here's who acts in it. The director of is this, it's their first film, second film, fourth feature, blah, blah, blah. The goal of the director for this film was to do this. And we're gonna release it here. And then it's just giving like the details of where it happens and when, the location and the timing for the screening, April 19th, 21st, 24th, and here are the places it's gonna be. Trailer of the film. You can see a trailer if you'd like here. That's kind of like linking a trailer or the concept art, not concept art, um, key art or whatever and saying, you know, if you wanna see it here, this is so you can have something to use with it. If you decide to release the news about this film. And then the companies that are with us was these things. Here's the release date. The release copies will be available at home. Oh, like how are you gonna release it? You know, we'll, we'll be releasing at theaters, blah, blah, blah. Or we'll release on Hulu starting this date you know, to be whatever you're doing, however you're releasing it. That's like something you might want to put in. And then obviously when, when it's releasing. <clears throat> and so that's basically like a general gist of what it would be like. They're pretty much all set up the same way. Something that this thing is missing is the company information, which we see on both of these up at the top left, it's just the contact information of how to get in touch with you or what your company's email and phone number is and who it is and your logo, if you have one, um, or your company name, if you don't, just at the top in the header. And this one says logo, it's the same thing. It's, they're a little bit different, but they pretty much have the same thing in mostly the same order. And then rain dance, same thing, <clears throat> sample layout, they give the, um, location and number, contact information about the company and the company up here. So you know who it is, company logo right next to the company's name on the other side. For more information, you can contact these people or go to this email. And then they could say for immediate release or to be released on whatever date. So whatever date you want the story released, that's where you put it before you put the title and then the title, location date, summary, news lead, five W's of who, what, when, where, why, and how, and who cares, why should anybody care about this? Info action statement, where to get more information or how to take advantage of the news, secondary details to expand on the first paragraph, background, history of the news item, organization ID or boilerplate, which is the companies that worked on this film or you know, the director or whoever. So basically they're all pretty much the same thing, same layout. They look a bit different, but they have the same basic setup or at least the same information in it, no matter what, how you do it. So definitely look up 
actual press releases and examples that are already done, like real, and then look up um, templates because there are templates out there that you can also use that you can download and just fill in the information. Because they're like I said, they're all you know. Sometimes the logo's up here on the top left. Sometimes it's over the top right. But in general, they follow a similar uh, structure. But yeah, you need press releases to send to news outlets so that they share your story or your news on their publication. That's the way you do it. Media advisories are to invite them to an event, invite them to come to cover a story. A media pitch is to say, hey, I think your publication would like to tell a story on us. So I think you should send somebody to our event or have an interview with us or what, go see our film or whatever it may be and then do a story on it. And a press release is, here's our story, here's what's happening, share it. All the information is in here and if you need anything else, contact us. Does anyone have any questions, comments or anything else about press releases? All right, so the next thing we're talking about. It's a lot, huh? What? It's just a lot of little things you don't really think about. Go into it, a lot of little details, a lot of 20 jobs in one. Owning it. As an independent filmmaker, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're wearing a bunch of hats. That's why they always say that. Because not only are you going to wear a bunch of hats in production, pre production, and then post if you're editing your own film, then you also have to be able to be a marketer. And there's so many different things that go into marketing. Uh, like press releases, and you have to make sure you write it right and professional enough that publications are actually going to pick it up and run it. It's just so much research that goes into it, so much work, so much attention to detail. Yeah, and that's why usually you want to try to have a team if you can. If you have a PR team working with you, then great, they're going to do this kind of stuff. If you don't, you want to either dedicate yourself to that or make somebody in the crew if you have like a few um you have a few producers, you might want them to be their own press release team or not press release, public relations team, basically, where they're doing this kind of uh, stuff. Anytime you need information sent out, they're the ones to handle it because they're trying to spread the news about this film as the producers. But if you're the producer yourself, then yeah, you're gonna have to take care of all this stuff, which is why it's important to know how to do it. Because if you're just emailing them straight off the bat, like, hey, I would, like you to talk about my film and you're not really giving them this structured official document press release of how you do it and they're never going to get in contact with you to run it i mean some of the local ones might say hey okay we'll need a press release from you but you know that's still less of a chance than just sending them the official thing that everyone else does so knowing this stuff beforehand is, is super important and even if you do have a team more often than not like if you're just starting out, there won't be a lot of um, like everyone is going to be a little raw, is going to be a little new at it. Yeah. So it's going to take some extra research, some extra work, even if you do have a team and you're going to have to delegate multiple jobs to multiple people. You know, yeah. Skeleton crew. Yep. That's why independent, like this is one of the reasons why independent films struggle so much is because there's so many different things that have to be handled and you don't have the budget for it. So you have to just make it work whatever way you can. And sometimes that means picking it up yourself and doing it. And then you're, you know, you're juggling a lot. So that's why thinking about all this stuff before you even start a film is super important because if you already have your marketing plan, if you already have a strategy in place for distribution, marketing, who you're gonna to try to get to distribute it, how you're gonna to try to market it. You already have an idea of your target audience. You have an idea of all the funding you're gonna need, your budget, you have it split up. You have a marketing budget, which we're talking about in just a second. Marketing budget, you have that split apart from the production budget to make sure that you have funding to do the marketing. Um, it's important to do beforehand so that you can approach investors, you know what you're doing, you have all the information that they need. You're more professional seeming. 
And just for yourself, even if you don't have investors, if you're paying out of pocket, you want to have a realistic expectation of how to get this done because you don't want to run into the issue that a lot of independent filmmakers run into, which is they put all their money into production and they didn't plan for post-production or they put all their money into production and post-production, but they didn't plan for distribution or marketing. So yeah, you have a great film, but you have no way of sharing it with people. You have no way of getting the awareness out. So thinking of all this stuff beforehand is the most important thing a filmmaker as an independent can do. Making yeah. a huge plan of all of these different things, keeping it, being aware of all these different things that are needing to be done and then kind of knowing when and where you're going to schedule it and how you're going to go about doing it can definitely help you in the end when you're finally finished with the film. Yeah, because at the end of the day, all the work you put into that film, all the time and money and stress and everything, it won't, it won't really amount to much if you don't know how to go about marketing it, about sharing it. At the end of the day, it'll be somewhat of a of like I don't want to say a waste because it's never a waste you always learn something but you'll be missing a huge opportunity you'll be missing a huge audience like that's a very big part of getting your film out there yeah yeah. all right moving on from that we are talking about marketing budget creating a marketing budget this is from Jetform, letter B in the syllabus. The video is how to create a marketing budget. Again, this is sort of talking more about businesses in general. So some of this stuff doesn't apply, but I think I didn't write any notes that didn't apply to film. Um, and the majority of it does. Marketing is pretty similar across the board, but there, of course, are different target audiences. You have a different thing you're trying to do. If it's a film, that's a service or a uh, product that's a lot different than if you're trying to sell hair gel or something. Yeah, but that's exactly why the budget is separate from the main production budget, because it's a whole thing of its own. It's a, there's a whole lot more that goes into it. And more often than not, there will be very similar key, key things that go for any type of marketing distribution. Yeah, definitely. Every company will separate a well every successful company will separate marketing um, and have a separate market marketing budget allocate some kind of funding for a marketing budget so that they can make people aware of their business their service their products or whatever it may be for marketing budgets you'll need to do some research into how much certain forms of marketing cost and make a lot of educated guesses they're not going to be spot on because you're not gonna know exactly how much you need to spend to reach the amount of people you wanna reach. Um, but you can look into it and kind of make some educated guesses based on estimates and um, what's been done before and how many people it's reached and things like that. How do you plan on marketing and what are your marketing goals? Having a goal can help you determine how much you would need or want to set aside for your marketing budget. If your goal is to get 10,000 people to see your film or something similar, you may also wanna look at your costs and set your goal to be whatever point lets you break even on your um, production. So instead of saying 10,000 people, you might be like actually looking at the cost of your film, entire budget, including the marketing budget and say, how many tickets would I need to sell to break even on what I spent? And then you can set that as your goal. And then anything that happens on top of that is just extra because now you're making profit. Um, but yeah, so you want to set some sort of goal. And then you can start to make researched, analysis-backed, educated guesses based on your target market and audience. Like how many ad views do you need to get one to one person to click a link? How many clicks do you need to get one person to buy a ticket? How many tickets do you need to sell to meet your goal? Of course, there are other steps that could be involved in this as well. Like how many people do you suspect need to see your key art before they watch the trailer? 
How many do they need to watch the trailer before visiting your site? How many visitors to the site before they might go buy a ticket? Then also just considering how much those ways of advertising, marketing, and promoting costs multiplied by the numbers you've guesstimated you're going to need. The costs and marketing budget will need to be different based on your target market and how they behave with marketing materials, as well as the type of marketing you think is best for you and your project. So if you have a target audience that reacts well to ads, they click on a bunch of them, whatever actually interests them, they click on a bunch of the links and they buy stuff, they buy tickets. If you figure that out by looking at their behaviors, doing a behavioral analysis of them, then you might consider that you maybe don't need as many people to see it um, as long as you're targeting it, right? You don't need as many people to see it because more people are actually gonna click on it. But if you figured out that their behavior is one in 1,000 people, click a link or one in 2,000 of my target audience follow through with whatever the link is trying to do. Yeah, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter your number as much as how much of that number actually has consistent engagement. Yeah, because you could have 80,000 people see the ad, but that doesn't mean anybody's going to click on it and go to it. So target audiences will be different, different age groups, different ethnicities, different regions. Some of them react differently. They behave differently Sometimes with their buying. Some people, people are more impulsive and some people are less impulsive. They take more time, research. Sometimes the genre of your film or the place that it's filmed, um, whether it be like a local thing or that can depend on how passionate um, or engaged your audience is as well. I don't know what PPC is. You and POC? Okay. Yeah, I actually don't know what PPC is. I know SEO is a uh, search engine optimization. I'm looking at, oh, pay-per-click. Yeah, Internet advertising model used sure. to drive traffic to websites in which an advertiser pays a publisher when the ad is clicked. Yeah. So it's different from um, putting an ad on like Google where anybody who sees it, you pay. It's I only pay when people click this ad. An example is um, a lot of YouTubers, they will have uh, ad sponsorships. And they actually, I can't speak for all of them, but I know that if some, when they work with those brands, they make money by just having the person click and check out the site. So they don't necessarily have to buy the product every time, but sometimes just by clicking on it, that's already. Also with certain ads, like on YouTube, the ones that you have that are skippable, if you skip it within the first five seconds, that person that's paying for the ad, they don't pay for you seeing it. But if you had stayed on longer than five seconds and you didn't skip, then they end up paying for your view, even though maybe you don't click on their link. That's also why you see a bunch Because you're of exposed to it longer and you stayed looking at their ad longer than the five seconds. So YouTube gives that um, on some of the ads. Some of the ads that aren't skippable, of course, you're going to pay for every single view that sees it. That's also where the term clickbait headlines came from because they want something that catches your eye because when you click on it, they make money. Yeah. And so pay there's pay per view, which is PPV, which is anybody who sees it, I'm paying a certain amount and it could be like half a cent or less per person seeing it. Um, or it could be, you know, up to like seven cents, 10 cents, however much, depending on how popular your thing is and how much you want it to stand out. If you, if somebody searched film, if you want your film to be the first thing seen you're gonna to have to pay a lot per view or per click to get yours to be the first thing that comes up um but yeah so ppc is pay-per-click which means you only pay for when people click on it and ppv would be pay-per-view which anybody who sees it you're paying seo is search engine optimization which is um we'll get into this later this semester but it is basically making sure that you have certain keywords in your um, website. Your website is very search engine friendly, where if somebody's searching for films or production companies on Google, um, by, by having certain keywords and certain metadata and things in your website, yours might pop up farther up the list of Google than the one that's not 
optimized, that one that doesn't have as many of those keywords and doesn't have as much of the metadata. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of stuff that goes into it. And usually people will hire um, professionals, professional SEO companies or people to make their website more search engine optimizable, which means it'll appear higher in results. You know, whenever you search something on Google, it says 18 million things came up. Well, you're not actually going to search through the 18 million, you might search through the first few pages. And so you want your thing to be more, um, more a keyword being more likely that somebody's going to search that specific word. And the more words you have that match what the person is searching, the better chances you have of your um, article or your website or whatever it is popping up first because it more closely matches the exact wording that the person is looking up on Google or another search engine. And that's what SEO is. Um, but yeah, we'll get into that more later on in the semester and how we can use it as filmmakers to try to make it keyword friendly and how you can look up some of the things that are trending and figure out what words people actually use to search. Do people actually look up independent film or do they more look up indie film? Those are very important when you're talking about search engine optimization because if somebody's looking up indie film, yours doesn't match. It matches film, but the word independent doesn't exactly match indie. And so if it does and the person looks up indie film, yours has a better chance of them seeing your result, if that makes sense. But yeah, marketing budget, you, this is like the showing the pie result of how they're going. This certain company is going to split its marketing budget and what it's going to utilize its budget on, what percentage of that budget is going to each of these different things. Um, but yeah, so, so setting goals will make you have a quantifiable limit like goal like if setting a quantifiable goal i mean will make you have an actual goal that you can meet reach or fail to reach so you always want to set it and make something quantifiable set a number to it you know whether it's dollar gain whether it's ticket sales whether it's how many people you want to see it or be aware of it or how many people you want to follow your social media or newsletter you always want to set some sort of goal so you can see how you're doing compared to what you wanted. And then you need to figure out how many people, how much money do I need to spend? Because let's say one in 1,000 people that see this ad are going to click on it. And then one in 400 people are going to click the link after they click on the ad to go further into the site or something, or they're gonna to go to the ticket area, whatever it may be. And then let's say, you know, out of those 400, only one of them are going to buy a ticket. And so then you start looking at those numbers and you start coming up with an idea of how much money do I need to spend to get that many people to see it so that this many people end up buying a ticket. If you say, Let's just completely generalize and say, to get people to take all the steps to get to buying a ticket from seeing an ad on Google, let's say it's one in 10,000 people. And if you're trying to sell 100,000 tickets, then you just do the math of, I don't know what that would even be, 100,000 times 10,000. Which obviously, if you're an independent filmmaker, you're probably not going to, be able to do this. But uh, <laughs> so you need one billion people to see it in order to sell those hundred thousand tickets. If that was really the number, so you know clearly, hopefully that's not the case, and hopefully you can target it more. Which is why it's important to target your marketing, so you're efficient with your marketing. The more people that see it, it's not going to be one in ten thousand. If you're just broadly showing your film and just expect not not targeting anybody not tar trying to target any kind of audience that's when you might end up spending a lot more than what it's worth which is just like like that if you're just broadly showing it all over the world to everybody 
you might need a billion people to see it so you get the number of people to buy the tickets because most of the people that see it aren't even interested in it. They don't like that kind of film or they don't even care about watching movies in general or whatever. They don't even go on Google. The kind of, uh, they don't actually follow ads on Google, your target audience. So, you know, though, knowing some of somewhat those things can help you really target your audience and hopefully make that number smaller so that you don't end up having to have 1 billion people see it just to get 100,000 ticket sales. And, you know, 100,000 is also pretty big for a independent film in most cases. So you also want to, you know, actually think about your budget and think about how many people are realistically, realistically going to see it, you know, all of those things. But it depends project to project, what your budget is, who you have in it. There's so many variables to it that it's not going to be exactly the same. Because like I said, it depends on your target audience and how they behave. How do they behave when they see an ad? Do they pass right over it? Do they have ad blockers all the time? And they might not even see your ad ever. You know, this type of stuff is important to know, which is why target audience, figuring that out is the most important thing. But after you figure that out, this is how you then create your marketing budget from that. Um, And then also, you know, like I said, you have to figure out how much those ways of advertising or marketing or promoting costs, because if you're doing video marketing, it might cost more than just a Google ad or a Facebook ad, or they might cost less. It just really depends on what you're trying to do and who you're trying to reach and how targeted you're trying to be and your guesstimate with your research of how many people need to see it or look at it or click on it to then do the further action of what you want that ad to do. Obviously, if you're advertising a film, you either want people to go see it, buy tickets if it's in theaters, download it or rent it if it's, in, um, if it's on a video on demand, or um, go on whatever platform it is to watch it, if it's on something like Tubi or Netflix or whatever it may be. So that's the purpose of the ad, to get people to go see it, get people to buy tickets, you know. Um, your ads might be for a premiere, and that would be to get people to come to the premiere, get people to come see the film at the event. So whatever your purpose is, you might want to do different sort, different kinds of advertising to try to reach them. This next stuff comes from Ali Dropship. It's letter C in the syllabus. It is planning your marketing budget in six steps for newbies. When coming up with your goals, be sure to make them quantifiable, just like I said, as they, they'll then be trackable. I want as many people to see my film as I can get isn't trackable or quantifiable. For normal businesses, they recommend 5% of your overall budget to maintain your position, 12% if you want the business to grow. As for normal businesses, we're in a bit of a niche because we're film and so we're specific to film. Um, but that's the general consensus of like overall regular businesses. If you wanna maintain your audience, you wanna maintain your amount of people that buy your product or see your thing or know your business, 5% of your overall budget should go towards marketing. If you want your business to grow, for it to reach new people, more people to buy your product or use your service or come see your film, 12% uh, of the overall budget. However, with different niches like film, you may spend up to 20% or more of your total budget on top of the original because you're trying to reach a very specific market. If you're very efficient with it, you can, you can reach the people that you want and not have to spend as much, which is what you wanna do, why it's so important to figure out your target audience, um, because you wanna specifically target them only without advertising to the people that you, that aren't in your target audience. That's why when we were talking about target audience, figuring out the smallest group of people that are gonna be your core audience, the people that you just like are almost sure 
are going to want to see your film. Um, those are the people you want to target first and then expand outward. Whereas if you're a huge company, you might want to do the opposite or you might want to target a little bit, but mainly just kind of target to everybody because you want to see how many people you can get. And you're not as worried about um, the money because you have so much more of it. So you're willing to spend a lot more on marketing. But for independent filmmakers, you're, you have to be super efficient to, in order to um, best utilize your marketing. And so you want to focus on the smallest group of people that you think are gonna watch it. And then at like a dartboard, you go out to the next ring. Okay, now who's the people that I'm almost sure are gonna see it? All right, now who's the people I think will probably want to? Might, maybe, but probably won't. And I don't know if they will. If you have enough budget, you can keep expanding outward. If not, focus on the core and then that's it. Because you can still make a bunch of money if you get your core audience to, to be aware of the film and actually come to it compared to if you just threw darts at the whole dartboard and uh, hope that your target audience sees it as well as others. Anyway, <clears throat> marketing budget. Be sure to check your analytics after you start marketing and see if you need to better utilize parts of your budget to other avenues that are working better. You also want a plan for breaking up your budget. If you decide you want to promote your posts on Instagram and your video trailer on YouTube, how much of your budget do you want to allocate to each? So after you break apart your marketing budget from your production budget, then just like this, uh, illustration, you want to start slicing it into little pie slices of how much of the budget should go to this kind of marketing, how much of the budget should go to that kind of marketing, how much money do I need to utilize on each thing. For the Instagram, YouTube thing, it might be 50-50, or it might be 60-40, 80-20, etc. Those are the only two avenues you're taking. It's pretty easy. You just have to split it in two. However, the more avenues that you want to take, the more you'll need to break those numbers down. So you don't overspend on any one thing. It could be like 25% to this, 25% to that, 15% to this, 15% to that, 10%, 5%, 5%, et cetera. And you can split those numbers up however much. You can split them up into multiples. You can make 1%. You know, whatever it is, you wanna to try to focus the most of your money on the thing that you think is going to work best you also usually want to stay varied in the way you market and have various platforms you can market on and the way you market and like focusing on maybe your website, your newsletter, um, social media, the different social medias, <coughs> and then, you know, as search engine optimization and all of that other stuff. And you figure out how much money do I think I need to spend here because I think this is the most viable option for my audience. Most of my audience is on Instagram. And that's probably where you want to spend the majority of your budget because you want to make sure to reach your target audience for the majority of your budget. Um, and then after you split it all up, after you split up these percentages, if your pie looks basically like this, you make sure that you only spend that percentage on the item you plan to spend. So if you plan to spend 5% on something, only spend 5% on it, unless it's getting you better results than something you allocated more money towards. Then think about reallocating more of the budget to the 5% item. So it has a larger part of the marketing budget to use instead of whatever the larger percent thing was. Let's take, let's take this example on this picture, actually. They have video. So that'd be like YouTube for your trailer, for behind the scenes, whatever. They only allocated 5% to it. Obviously for film, you're probably gonna allocate more than that. But let's just take this as the example since it's already on screen. 15% they put to search engine optimization and 5% to video. If you did the same thing and you saw that, oh wow, a lot of people are reacting to the video they're clicking on it, they're looking in the description and they're buying tickets to the film and nobody on Google is coming or nobody on DuckDuckGo or whatever search engine is coming to my website, then you probably wanna take more of this budget in the 15% and put it into the video, the 5%, so that you can put more money into YouTube 
because it's working better than the search engine optimization was. So follow along with your analytics when you're doing your marketing budget, because just because you have a marketing budget, you made a plan, you want to also be adaptable with it so that you can best utilize the funding that you already have made for your marketing budget in general. This next stuff comes from beverlyboy.com, letter D in the syllabus. For film, a marketing budget is often created separately from a production budget. If you only have $100,000 total, <clears throat> break it down into two budgets first. Maybe you decide that $80,000 is gonna be your production budget and $20,000 is gonna be your marketing budget. If that's what you decide, then you now have $80,000 to make your movie, pre-production, production, post-production, post -production, and distribution, which you may also want to split off. Or you might wanna include distribution in the cost of post-production part of the budget. Just depends how you wanna split it up. But definitely be sure to have money separated for distribution too, like we talked about last semester. Whether you put it inside of your post-production budget or not, just be sure there's funding for it because you're gonna need it. <clears throat> for large budget projects, it's not uncommon for another 50% of the budget to be used for marketing. So a $100, $100 million budget film may also use a 50 million market marketing budget on top of it which would mean that the total budget for that film was 150 million, not 100 million. And we already talked about this, but if you see the budget on Wikipedia or another site for a film, they're just talking about the production budget. They're not talking about the marketing budget as well. So the marketing budget can be any number. And that's why films have to make so many multiples of their budget to break even because of the waterfall and also the marketing budget on top of the production budget. For large budgeted projects, around two thirds of the total marketing budget goes to television advertising and commercial slots for the trailer or teaser. I don't know if that's still true necessarily. I think it's a little bit less than that, but it still is a large part because commercials are expensive and still a lot of people watch TV. Billboards, bus stops, movie poster ads, all the kind of outdoor ads cost around 28% of the budget, 5% for press ads, <clears throat> radio is less than 3% typically, online advertising is growing larger portions of the marketing budget are being taken from TV and outdoor ads to be used on online advertising, and it's expected to grow as time goes on because more people are viewing, going online and um, more people are online, more people are using more of their time spent online on social media and websites and articles and search engines and everything else. So if more people are there, that's where the eyes are. That's where we want our ads. And that's why big companies are starting to put more effort, put more budget into online advertising. But you're not gonna have the biggest budget for an independent film. So you want to be sure to think of all of the costs, including marketing and budget them in. By budgeting for it, having a plan and knowing your target audience and being resourceful, independent filmmakers can make a little go a long way. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything to add on marketing budgets? I, th I think you touched on it really well. I feel like you had a lot of notes. I do have a lot of notes. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like you covered everything that I can remember. All right. Yeah, because while I'm going through, I write down what they say, and I also write down what I think of what they said or something like that. So, <clears throat> all right. The next thing we're talking about is pitch fests. This stuff comes from storypros.com. It's letter B in the syllabus. A pitch fest is normally a one or two day event where writers pay the organizers of the event to have an opportunity to pitch their ideas, screenplays, and novels to agents, managers, producers, 
executives, junior executives, uh, or and or junior executives at the company, studios, networks, and literary agencies. The invited executives spend the day in a large hotel ballroom or convention center room where they sit at a table with a sign identifying who they are and their company. Now, the example I have, I'm not really sure why it says anonymous content on it, but normally it would say like who this person is and um, what they have. And then you'd have like a thing sent to you before the pitch fest that tells you where everyone will be, what table they'll be sitting at. And then you kind of figure out who you want to have a meeting with, who you don't, and uh, set it up or stand in line waiting to go to certain tables to try to pitch to certain people. Um, the writers either wait in line, like I just said, or with a set appointment time, they create a set appointment time to sit down in front of them for around seven minutes usually to do their pitch. The executives listen intently, hoping to find a perfect idea from a fresh voice. You'll be able to quickly hone your pitch as you go from pitch to pitch throughout the days. There are eight main pitch fests that they mentioned in this site, which is storypros.com. However, when I was trying to look for some of them, I couldn't find it. So I'm not sure if they closed down or not. But one of the main ones is what's called Fade In. Fade In has been around, I think it's the first one that started it. And it's been around the longest. Um, so Fade In Pitch Fest, that's one that's used a lot. There's the Great American Pitch Fest, which I'm not sure. I, I couldn't find a website for that one. So again, I don't know. You have to look more into it. Then there is the Great Canadian Pitch Fest. This one is the American Screenwriters Association Pitch Fest. Creative Screenwriting Magazine Pitch Fest. Now for take a meeting, I couldn't find it. So I don't know what that means. It might've closed down, but it was like take dash a dash meeting, take a meeting. I don't know if it's closed down or not, like I said. Um, and then the Great American slash Canadian Pitch Fest, which is pretty much a combination of the other two. But again, the main one is Fade In. Um, and any of the other ones, just make sure you do your research on it because clearly some of them don't stick around too long. Some of these will charge a flat fee for the two days and some charge per pitch, either around $25 for one pitch or $100 for five pitches. It definitely yeah, it depends on like which one you're doing, which event it is, how they set it up, because they're all going to be a bit different in their pricing and how they do it. Like the ones that charge a flat fee, you'll get to set up however many pitches. They might have a certain limit um, to what how many you can do. And then you set those up to who you most want to pitch to. I would imagine someone have a time limit as well, right? They all have a time limit. They're usually around five to seven minutes for each pitch. Oh, okay. Fade in charges a flat fee and lets you set up 12 meetings over the two days and then unlimited pitches by waiting in line for the others. Great American slash Canadian Pitch Fest uses a different format where you can wait in line and fit as many pitches as you can into the day. That's why it's important for you to practice your pitch, your, your log lines, your slug lines, all that stuff. Because if you only have five minutes, yeah. you don't want to end up yeah, it's more in the it's more in that uh, it's it's it feels it's like sort it's of lot, set up it's, it's sort of set up as we've talked about this already the the twenty minute pitch or the pitch meeting where you actually sit down and schedule with a company to do a pitch meeting with them it's sort of like that but the time limit makes it more like an extended elevator pitch so elevator yeah. pitches can be anywhere from thirty seconds to three or five minutes because some people hear five minutes and they're like oh that's actually a lot of time it's really not. That's so why you want to time yourself and be sure you're going to get through your whole pitch. That would be a really <laughs> good exercise, line. actually, timing yourself and trying to get 
trying to pitch it and write it, maybe writing it down. Pitching in the mirror, actually pitching with people. Yeah. All of those things we talked about when we were talking about pitching. But when you go to people, you ask them, so what do you think? Were you bored? Do you think I rambled on for a moment there? Like, what do you think is unnecessary? What do you think I forgot? Did I forget anything about the story that's like super important? Yeah. So at these pitch festivals, if you go after the big name companies and executives, be prepared to wait a long time. Obviously, if it's somebody that works in a big company, a lot of people are going to try to reach out to them because they want to work with that big company. Um, and so if you're waiting in line, you might be waiting in line multiple hours or half a day, depending on how big that executive is or what company they work for. Um, so you, you want to be considering that while you're doing, if you're going to go to one of these things, consider like how, if it's the way it's set up, you know, obviously because they're all set up differently. If it's not set up where you are scheduling a meeting, because you can schedule a meeting um, with one and then you'll, you'll definitely get to go to that scheduled meeting. But if you're just, if it's one of those ones where you wait in line, you want to be aware that the bigger companies, the, the larger executives and all that, they're going to have more people waiting in line for them. Think of it as going to an amusement park. The best rides, you're going to wait the longest to ride. That doesn't mean it's not worth it to go on, wait in line that long to go on it, but to some people, it's more worth it to go to the less popular rides multiple times. So just think about that. You might want to go to smaller companies instead and more multiple smaller companies compared to one big company to try to pitch. But ultimately that'll be up to you. Um, it's good to have a minute, it's great. I think doing a pitch would be fun. You practice, yeah. Oh yeah, a practice pitch. Um, that, that's what you wanna do if you're trying to pitch to anybody. If you have an idea at all and you're an actor, or you are the screenwriter, or you're the director or producer, you wanna practice your pitch because you never know when you're gonna be in a situation where you are going to need it. Elevator pitches in general, you wanna practice because that's the ones where you might meet somebody and be like, they might ask, what do you do? And there's your opening, there's your chance, there's your chance to tell them exactly what you're trying to do at that moment. And that's gonna be your film or your project that you're trying to get funding for or distribution for or whatever it may be, you know? And that's, that's where your pitch comes in. Oh, well, I actually work in here. Oh, really? What's it about? Here we go, blah, 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 blah. If you can get it out in a few minutes, you might hold their attention long enough to get them to be interested in maybe giving you a full meeting or getting you in contact with somebody that can give you a meeting or something like that. So once you have an idea, practicing your elevator pitch, uh, is a definite. But for the pitch fest, um, the pitch fest organizers will provide the list of companies and executives that are attending, their contact information, and a list of their credits, like what they've worked on, and the genres and budgets that they do and do not want. That actually is very good and very useful because you'll quickly be able to see who works with who and like what budgets they work with and what they want and what they don't want. So if your genre isn't in the genres that they want, or if your budget is lower or higher than the budgets that they're going for, then you know that you should go with somebody else. You don't want to pitch to them because there's no point. So um, that is, I think that is very useful information because if you are trying to pitch your idea on your own, you have to do all this research, but if you're going to one of these pitch fests, just with that information alone, it might make it a little bit more worth it because you'll quickly see what kind of budgets and what kind of genres they work with. And you'll, you won't have to dig in as much because you'll have that information right then and there. Yeah, a lot of, what, a lot of their, what, they probably have a website that'll have all that information and all that stuff broken down anyway, so. Yeah. And that'll allow you to decide, to decide in advance who is best suited to your scripts and your ideas. So you can decide who do I want to pitch to. Some have more niches too, right? They go, they're like more specific than others. That's another thing too. 
Yeah, some are very specific. Obviously, the larger companies, they might be a little more varied or broad with what they what kind of content they make. But the smaller companies, they're definitely going to have more of a niche audience or something like that. So those might be perfect for your project. It just depends. I would say just like with the distribution budget, um, either add that like to a specific budget, like I'm going to spend this much money on these pitch fests and I'm going to allocate this much. This is my limit. This is my cap. Um, or I'm going to apply for five different ones in different So places. a pitch fest is more to try to raise funding. No, yeah, but you have to pay a fee. Yes, you have so to pay. That's what I mean. But like, I'm saying, like, um, you know, so you're you just, end up spending more money than you can afford. It's good to have a plan when going into this, you know. Right, but it's not going to. Mm, if unless you're trying to pitch it for distribution, if you're pitching your idea to try to raise funding, you will have your budget, but you're not going to. I mean, you're going to be spending before you have a budget. No, before no, you have no but I just mean that if it were me. I would go into it like, okay, I need, like, I, I want to have a budget for this film. I want to get distribution, but I also need to think about if I don't get as much as I want, or if, you know, I don't get any at all, that's a reality. Um, I need to be, be careful about how much I spend on these and if they're even worth it, because sometimes there, there are people that will just throw money at it and apply for as many as possible. When that's a waste of money and a waste of time. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. so that's what I mean. Like having that plan is always important in every step of the way. Yeah, having a plan, like, well, with how much you're spending, that's why you know these events sometimes will have you can do unlimited. Here's the full cost flat fee up front, like fade in. And others will do pay per pitch or pay per five pitches. And that way you can limit yourself to how much you're spending on. You know, how many people do I want to pitch to? How much do I need to spend to be able to pitch to this many people? Um, but you definitely don't want to just, like Priscilla said, just go out and spend thousands and thousands pitching to every single company out there. Because again, you're going to have the information of who's going to like it, who's not, when you are um, applying, when you are in the stage of uh, being in that pitch fest, going to that pitch fest. You're going to have the information of who else is going and what do they want. And that way you can limit yourself to how much you're spending because you can, you can spend on the ones who are focused on the kind of content that you're trying to make. Now, again, if you already have your film, um, like Priscilla said, then you did want to budget this type of thing in. If you're trying to do pitch fest to um, pitch your film that's already made to distributors, then that's something. But you also want to check the pitch fest and make sure that they have distributors come and not just studios, executives, and people who are trying to um, buy your screenplay to make the film. They're actually trying to buy films too. And that may or may not be the case depending on the pitch fest that you're going to. So definitely look that up if that's what you have. And if that is your plan that you're going to make the film and then pitch it at one of these pitch fests, then you definitely want to put that cost into your budget, like Priscilla was saying. Um, where am I at? But yeah, definitely be sure to pay attention to the list of what they want, what they don't want, so that you're not wasting your time and your money pitching to the wrong people. Dress casually for the event. Most of these events are not formal, so you don't have to come in a suit and tie. And the website specifically said if you do come in a suit and tie, it doesn't really help. Uh, it's not like it's going to stand you apart just because you are wearing a suit and tie. However, certain events may request formal attire. So again, just pay attention to it um, just in case. But most of them, I believe, are dressed casually dressed. So you don't have to worry about uh, dressing fancy in a dress or a suit or whatever. Be sure to leave them, whenever you go to each of these pitches and you're doing your pitches at the table, be sure to leave them with a one sheet of your log line or multiple log lines if you have multiple ideas, but you can't pitch them all. 
So you're like, here's my idea, my best idea. And if you like that, here's my other ideas. Some people will do that. Um, so you can leave your log line or log lines and contact information, information, information for each. And that'll be your one sheet. That'll be basically if they liked you, they can remember you and see what you, the uh, general idea with the log line. So they get a remember, they can remember what that was about. And then your contact information, obviously, so they can contact you to get more, maybe to get the script or maybe to discuss further with you, set up a, 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 a 20 minute pitch meeting. You also want to bring business cards just in case too, because you never know who you might be able to connect with or meet. There's going to be other writers there. There's probably going to be some producers and stuff there too, maybe. So you, you might meet some people that can help you out in the future, even if they're not going to be the people you're pitching to in the moment. So definitely bring some business cards and network with people while you're waiting, because some of the stuff will be waiting around. And that's a perfect time to talk to people about their experiences and what they're working on and whatever else. If the executive wants your script, they may want it emailed or they may want it mailed to them with a physical copy. If you're mailing a physical copy or if you're emailing, put requested material on the package or in the header of the email. Um, have a cover sheet or begin the email by explaining who you are and that they requested the script from the event that you were at so that they can quickly remember uh, because you know it might arrive to them a week, two weeks later, however long. Um, and you wanna be sure that they remember what this is and it's not just some unsolicited script sent to them. It's actually, oh, this was, I did request them to send this. That's the person I met at the pitch meeting who had a really good, or pitch fest, who had a really good pitch and I want to read the script. That way they can just remember really quickly off the bat so they don't throw it in their spam, throw it in their trash, whatever. So if they request it, listen to how they request it, whether it's emailed or a physical copy or both, uh, and then do whatever they say, but also just be sure to add those little details to make sure that they don't throw it away. Because they're going to pay attention if you don't follow instruction. That's like the main thing. Yeah. We request and that you're they're not even gonna gonna think what two seconds are like if you ask for like a, a different specific format if they ask like oh we want it in a specific format or we have this or that or it's a specific genre and then you bring it they're just like nope i yep think. so always pay attention to how you're told to do things because that's super important to uh keeping their interest and, also because you waste time and money if you don't do it so yeah and also them. you look like less of a professional and you never want to look like an amateur that is probably one of the most frustrating things that i have seen is the amount of people that will waste their time and the time of of investors of, of people they're pitching to all this kind of stuff because they don't actually read the information or they don't take it seriously or they don't pay enough attention to it. And then they waste their time and the person's time. Yeah. They focus so much on like applying for every single thing that they waste the time, money, they waste time. And super precious. So like understanding, like taking the time to like, what's it called? Fast track everything is worth it. So instead yeah. of doing everything the long way, if you can skip steps, but still keep the same quality, always do that. And that usually just comes from compounded um it's not skippy steps it's just what's it called uh all mixed together you know like you in photoshop you just like merge it all into one picture and now it's one file instead of 10 so i feel like the same thing with pitches it's just like compile it all into kind of like one well, that's another thing we have to be specific about if they specifically ask like hey i want it all separate and you put it all together that's another thing so it's not just the type of file but how they want it like well we're talking about scripts so they're usually they're gonna want it all at once yeah but i i just mean it as an example of like read the whole freaking instruction thing because that's another thing a lot of people don't do well at the pitch fest you have to actually you have to listen you have to listen to what they're saying how they said it because if they say oh mail me the script and you heard email me you're going to email it and they're not going to receive it because maybe they don't take email 
scripts. Is there the possibility of maybe recording it on your phone? Because it is a stressful situation. You might forget or you might miss, mishear something. So like maybe you can have your phone on record to like re record the, what they're saying. I'm not sure. And it depends on the state. I do not think that LA, if that's the place you're at, allows you to do that. I don't know. Oh, right. Because there's a whole like I don't think one-sided one -sided conversations started. allowed to be recorded. Certain states allow you to do that. Certain ones down. Well, maybe write it down. Like plus, as soon as you plus, can. I mean, you, if you're there and you're listening and they're like, oh, that's awesome. We'd love to. You're going to, you're going to pay attention or you should. Yeah, that's true. You're not going to be stressed at that point because they're saying yes to your thing. So you're like, oh yeah, and you're elevated. Um, and you're going to remember it because that's the whole reason you went there. Or you better remember it. If you don't, then that's on you. If you're that, if you're that forgetful that you need to record it when someone says, send me the script then uh, I don't know if you should be in this business. No, yeah, true. Because, <laughs> yeah, it is a nervous, it is like a very nerve-wracking situation, but you also have to, you have to have that professionalism one time or another. At yeah. some point, you just have to learn how to deal with it. But, yeah, um, you always want to, like, like Sarah was saying, like, people's time is precious, especially these executives, because they have, think about it, you're hearing pitches all of the time. And so your time is spent hearing a pitch over and over and over again. And some of them are very professional. Some of the pitches are really cool and good. And some of those are a mix between people who aren't professional and are. And you have to go and sort through all these people to make sure that you're getting someone who is professional, who also has an interesting sounding idea. Um, and you're going through so many that you don't have time to spend too much on any one of them because you have to go through so many to find the good ones. So wasting people's time, especially if they don't even do horror films and you're pitching them a horror film, it's not gonna go over well. They're not gonna ever wanna hear a pitch from you again, even if you come to them next time with an action film because they do action films. You know, They're gonna be like, oh, no, not you. If they remember you, they might not, but just having that um, awareness of other people's time and that this executive's not being a jerk. They just don't, they just literally don't have that amount of time to spend with you to discuss what you could do differently or whatever about the pitch. Yeah. The reason why you only get seven minutes is because there's other people that are already there going to pitch to them. And the whole day they're gonna be hearing seven minute pitches here, 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 here until they go to break or lunch and then come back to hear more. Um, and you get seven minutes because there's a whole room of other people that are trying to get with this one person. So they literally don't have that time to spend 20 to 30 to 50 minutes on your one project. And you have to make sure that you are aware of that in all cases with every kind of business you're trying to get into and discuss with. Um, just like we were talking about with press releases, the news outlets get a ton of them. You don't want to waste their time with too many details. There's so many things that keep saying with this type of stuff, with marketing and pitching, you always want to be succinct and to the point. Be brief, get out the information, but make sure you have it in a way that's easily to read, that's clear, and that's quick. Because if you make it long, drug out, boring, and too overly detailed, then, then nobody's going to read it. They're going to skip right over it because they don't have the time to take to see if there's something interesting in all of this boring. Yeah, Farron, if you've got enough, like, film a pitch, like, film five minutes. If you have enough, like, juice and you've got enough, like, just get out there, film a couple of the great scenes and, like, be like, here's the written pitch, here's the script, um, here's this, and here's my business plan and how we're going to market it in the target audience and have it all together in, like, one big package. And then you might have a really good chance of having somebody, you know, be invested in your film because they'll see that you're really, um, what's it called, organized and you have it all together. Um, if you don't have the budget to actually film a pitch, I mean, like, probably just going and doing it with, like, uh, whoever you're pitching to. I mean, uh, a written pitch isn't bad. Just, like, seeing the commitment to doing, like, a uh, filmed pitch shows just, like, that you're a little bit more committed than other people. So, I mean... That's, that's my thinking, what I've seen professionals do is they'll film like a, a quick trailer. Yeah, and that way you can have like a sort of a sense, a visual to go along with the pitch that you're telling them about 
um, at these pitch fests, it's, you can't really do that, but you're right about like pitch meetings or maybe an elevator pitch. If you have it on your phone, you can just quickly, oh, here you go, bring. It could work. Um, and especially at a, at a pitch meeting, it definitely works. But you also want to be aware of how you're pitching it and where you're pitching it because it, it's not going to work every time. But at a pitch meeting, those kinds of things will definitely work because you want those visuals to go along with what you're talking about so that they can understand exactly what you mean when you're saying, oh, I want it to look sort of like this. Instead of just saying that, you can actually show them what you mean and they go, oh yeah, and they get the idea right away. Um, so that's definitely a good tip, Sarah. All right, this next up comes from writersupercenter.com. It's letter D in the syllabus. There's usually a bell or an announcement every seven minutes to indicate the next writer's turn to pitch. Also with the seven minutes, generally around two of those minutes are to go in and go out of the room. So you basically only have five minutes to actually pitch. The other two minutes are getting in and out. The writers sit in a waiting area until theirs is next to pitch. So if they're in a waiting area in a line waiting to go to somebody, they'll be in a separate room generally. And then there'll be an announcement or a bell, bling, and that's the next person go in or next person please, whatever the announcement might be. And that way they know it's the next person's turn. While waiting, that's the best place where you can network with other writers and share experiences. So definitely have your pitch down. Hopefully you're not having to practice it while you're in the room. Hopefully you practice it enough to where you have it ready to go no matter what happens. Like we were saying the other, the other meeting, we were talking about pitch, pitching, uh, elevator pitches and standard pitches. You want to have it down to where if somebody asks you a question in the middle of it, you don't lose your train of thought. You can pick it up right where you left off. Because if it feels overly rehearsed, that's another thing that they like pay attention to. Like, hmm, maybe he doesn't know as much about a story because. Seems like he rehearsed the main points. Not necessarily. No, I know sort but of, some people look at it that way. Yeah, but it's also, I mean, most people, <clears throat> most professionals won't interrupt you, I've heard, but it depends on their mood. And so if they're in a bad mood, if they're like, I don't really care about the story in their head already, they might just be like, huh, well, what's this about? Or, you or know, if they whatever. Want to rush through it, like, yeah, like, I don't know, I, I'm getting ready to go to break. If you're the one right before their break, they might just be like, come on, hurry up, get out. So at these pitch fests, it's a little bit better because it's structured and there's like, you know, the time limits for each. So they know they have five minutes until they can go. But um, elevator pitches in general, especially if you're just meeting somebody at a party or at dinner or whatever, they're not going to want to do work. So if you're pitching to them, you better make sure it's quick. Because that, those are the times when it's hardest to get people interested because they don't want to have to do it, especially if that's something they do all the time. That's another thing to think about. Um, but at the pitch fest, they're, they're there specifically to hear pitches. So that's, that's why it's a good way to do your elevator pitch. But again, you want to make sure you have it in your head as best as possible so that if they do interrupt or that you don't have to constantly go over your pitch while you're waiting, that way... You have your pitch, you're ready to go when you get in the room, but while you're waiting, you network with other people. If there's producers in there that are trying to pitch a, a, a script or if there's writers, you can talk with them. Maybe you can collaborate with them later on. Maybe that producer will work with you on the project later. Networking is huge. So, you know, you want to be able to do that without losing your pitch. So you want to have that already down and packed and ready to go, no matter what you start talking about with other people. You don't want to talk about, but then you don't want to talk with, you don't want to network and forget your pitch. Um, and that's why it's so important to, to rehearse it so much. Also, because you might be nervous. So the more you practice it, the better too, so that you don't end up getting overly nervous, forgetting a line, forgetting a, a main post and very important point. You know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You want to make sure that you, um, give yourself enough time because you'll be in a different environment you'll be nervous because you know this is a make or break moment in a way and so 
if you already have it prepared, if you already have it down packed, then you're not going to forget it just from nerve being nervous and anxious alone. And then, of course, you can ease up and stop being so anxious about it if you're just discussing and, and talking with people in the, in the room while you're waiting. You'll have a better time than if you're just in your head like, okay, and then, and then I'll say this, and then, oh, crap, what was the other thing? Or whatever you're thinking, like you're going to freak yourself out more than you need to. So practice, practice, practice. If you have an idea, if you have a script, if you have an already made film, practice your pitching before you get into one of those moments that way you're ready to go. Also, like Vish said, that's a very good tip. Leave time for questions and answers. Make sure that you have five minutes. It doesn't mean you want to take up the five minutes with your pitch. You want to take up maybe three. That way there's two minutes where they can ask a question or two and then you can have a little discussion with them, maybe four minutes, you know, and then one minute you have to kind of like, okay. And then, why did they do this? Or, oh, what do you think this would be? Who do you think the target audience is for that kind of script? Whatever yeah, they want to ask. That make a huge difference too, because they might be curious about something and that thing might be the thing that makes a difference of if they like go for it or not. Right, and because this, is, this isn't a pitch meeting. Pitch meetings, it's their company. They scheduled it. So even if they have a meeting three minutes later, they could make that person wait. At a pitch fest, it's the pitch festival's time schedule and they can't go over that time. So even if they would want to, they have to get you, if they wanna know more, they actually have to get you to send the script or contact them later. So that's why, like Priscilla said, that one question that they really wanna know, who do you think the audience is? If you have an answer for that and you know who your audience could be and how big it might be, if you answer that question before your pitch is done, they might be like, okay, I'm going to, here you go. Break, yeah. You know, that could be your make or break moment for your pitch. So you definitely want to leave time at the end. Don't take up the whole thing with your pitch. And that's the same thing with elevator pitches. You want to make them as quick, succinct, brief as possible and to the point so that if they want to know more, they can. And if not, they can just pass quickly. But um that goes with any pitch. Whether you have a 20 minute one or a five minute one, make sure that you aren't taking up all of the time just with the pitch alone. When you get into the room where you're going to pitch, you want to introduce yourself, mention if you've won any screenwriting awards or competitions, or if you have a film in the festival, if the pitch fest is associated with a film festival, just got to be careful not to make it sound cocky. Oh, I won the award. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I actually won an award, you know, like, you know, be humble, but also make sure you tell what you're capable of. If you won an award, that is something they want to know. But don't wear it on your sleeve as like a you need me. Because I won an award. So for me, <laughs> I was just, I'm not very good at social interactions. When they're like first social interactions, I get very anxious. I would say get someone you know, you, you like, like a friend or whatever, and be like, hey, can I practice this with you? Tell me if it sounds douchey. Like, how do I bring this into the conversation? Or, oh, start with, like, let, by letting them know, but not in like a be bag kind of way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, I was also putting the intonation of, <laughs> of someone who's kind of stuck up. Yeah, but sometimes oh. it comes off that way when you're nervous or when you are like, oh, I need to point this out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, either way, yeah, you definitely want to practice it. Practice your pitch. Make sure you sound humble and professional, but also make them aware of what you've done. If you do have a film, if the Pitch Fest is associated with a film festival that's happening next door, you want to be like, hey, you know, actually, yeah, I have a, I have a film in that, in that festival. That way, if they want to know more about what you're capable of, you're pitching them an idea or you're pitching them a script and you have a film in that festival. They're like, wow, he has two projects. Let me check out his other project if I'm interested in this one. And then they can kind of see what you're capable of and if they want to work with you or not, even more so than just with the pitch alone. But if all you have is a pitch, if you did win an award, that is something they want to know too, because Oh, this is they, you won an award. 
Well, then that means that some people thought this was worth something. Let me hear it. So if you have any of that, give it. If not, you can just introduce yourself of who you are. Give the genre and your log line. If you lost a competition, maybe don't bring that up. No, yeah, don't. <laughs> I entered this competition. Like, it doesn't matter what you've entered. Unnecessary details, leave out. Unless you want. You only have a limited genre. time. You're only giving the best of the best yeah. at this moment. Give your genre. They say that's like one of the most important things to start off with because they immediately have an idea of what that film is kind of like just based on the genre. And then, of course, your log line. Ryan Booker said, Shark Tank is a great show to watch to learn how to give a good pitch. Oh, I agree. And those are oh, usually yeah. products but they and services, but they only have a limited time in front of these very wealthy people to try to get them to invest. And it's a very... Uh, yeah, fun exercise. It's a very scary environment yeah. because there's three people staring at you and they're going to ask you questions about why you think this is worth something and you got to be ready to go with the answers and you know it, they're very they're eyeing you like sharks and sometimes they say <laughs> and it, it feels that way which is why it's called the shark thing and sometimes they say it in an intimidating way just to see if you scare easy that's another thing they're not trying to be devags sometimes they're like then why do you think your product's worth it like just in a very like okay let's see if he actually believes in it or if he breaks yeah <laughs> which is kind of fun to watch but yeah so when you're in the room introduce yourself give out any awards you won or if you have a film if it's associated with film festival if it's not associated with a film festival don't just say yeah i have a film over there and there it's only you should really only mention that if it's pertains to the actual thing that's that's happening so if it's a pitch fest at a festival they can actually go the next day to look at the film in the festival. Um, but if it's just a random, I had it over there, or I have it online, that's something you don't really need to uh, discuss. You can just say, this is my second film, or this will be my, this project, third, fourth, fifth, whatever it may be. But anyway, give your genre and your log line. You may also state what projects of theirs you like, if you're familiar, before you begin. So like before you even, you're like, hi, I'm this. Like, oh, I loved your, this film that you did. You, I thought you guys did really well with that. Oh, thanks, blah, blah, blah. You can do that if you actually know. If you don't know, I would say don't really do that because you don't want them to be like, oh, what'd you like best? And you'd be like. Uh. And don't overdo it because no one likes a kiss ass. Yeah, I, it's just like a quick mention of what you like if you actually know what they've done. Yeah, because it might, it might be a compliment or it might seem like you're trying to sweet talk them. It's a very hard balance to find. I feel like when you're nervous. Yeah. But also, certain people like that. So. Mm. Oh, yeah, but you <laughs> never know. Some people yeah, you never like know. it, but it might feel like you're forcing it and like you're trying really hard. And they're like, huh. Right. Sounds desperate. You know, never know. All right. And then you want to set up your characters and make your pitch interesting. Tell the significant parts of the story and emotional moments then wrap it up with an ending. Ask if they have any questions. If they say no thanks or it's not right for them, say thanks and move on. Don't confront them. Be polite and maybe even ask what they're looking for and if you can contact them again. Like, oh, that's not, that's not really what we're looking for. You might be able to be like, oh, okay. Do you have any suggestions? Thanks. What do you, what, what, what do you generally look for? And would I be able to pitch to you again later in the future? You know, can I contact you? And then you can see if they say yes or no. Because you'll have their contact information from the pitch fest itself. And so they might be able to, they might say, we usually do this kind of content. If you have anything like that, go ahead and email me here. And there you go. You just open a new avenue of, maybe I can pitch to them again and get a different project made um, if they didn't like whatever you had given them at the table. Instead of being like, I think this is great and confronting them and you know, obviously blowing up at them is not good anywhere. It's not professional. You wanna leave a contact sheet with your idea and business card. There are also, oh, and then you wanna leave a contact sheet with your business card and your idea so they can contact you again and remember, who you are and what you were pitching. Then um, there are also virtual pitch fests where you can purchase five pitches for $50 or 10 for $100. Writers then have an opportunity 
to send an email with the log line and brief summary of their screenplay to participating companies. And then companies then have five days to respond. So they actually have to respond whether it's a no or a yes. And that way you can make sure that you are getting in contact with these companies and these executives and that they are also actually going to check out your pitch, hopefully. Um, and then, you know, they'll leave, instead of just sending it out to random people, you actually have the opportunity of them having to reply back, which is a really good thing, but the cost may not be worth it. So you have to always think about that and decide for yourself whether it is for you or not. While nothing is guaranteed, pitch fest generally make it easier to find, identify, get in contact with, and pitch to these executives more than a cold call or a cold email would, or an unsolicited email pitch. With the short time frame you have, it's more like an elevator pitch. However, the good thing about it is there are there the people there are actually there for the pitches. So it's more like a 20 minute pitch or a pitch meeting in that way that they are set up and ready to hear pitches. Elevator pitches, the hardest part about it, like I said, is they're not at work. They're at a dinner, they're at a party, they're at the bar and you run into them. And then you are kind of making them have to do work by pitching to them with an elevator pitch. With pitch fest, you can use your, pit, your elevator pitch and they're also there specifically to hear it. Um, so that is pitch fest with elevator pitches. Like we said already, when we were talking about elevator pitches, before you even give it, you want to make sure that they're interested and you're not just starting off the conversation by pitching. Um, make sure that they're, they, they want to know what you do or who you are. And then they, and then they're interested in what you do and what your film is about. Oh, I'm a filmmaker. Oh, really? What are you making? then that's your opening if you're just in a random place and you're trying to do an elevator pitch. Obviously at a pitch fest, you wanna introduce yourself and then maybe jump right in because you only have a small amount of time to pitch to them and they're there for that pitch. But does anyone have anything to ask or comments or anything about pitch fests? Has anyone done one? Yeah, I mean, I've had people pitch to me a lot. Um, trying to get me to do you know like free free cinematography so they can get their concept working or whatever but um film school is um they make you pitch um your idea they have a at the end of the year they always have a a festival so i've done it for like three years and um sit you in front of their they have their own little panel and stuff and you pitch them your idea and if they green light it, then you go ahead and write it and then you shoot it and all that good stuff. Um, but some of the things they did, so this is one of the, the beneficial things that come out of film school is getting this type of experience. And they run legit, you know, as if they were like executives from like, BET. you know, these, my, my, my professors work for like BET and stuff like that. So like um, things, things that they teach you is like, you know, um, normally in a in a panel of like three to four um there's always somebody that's usually running the show mm -hmm. um not necessarily that this person is you know in charge maybe but somebody somebody's always going to lead the the panel um they may or may not give away who's actually pulling the strings but um there's always somebody that's leading and it's usually like the, the main guy that's or woman that's um the first one to shake your hand the first one to stand up the first one to make eye contact with you and the one that's mainly asking most of the questions um is usually the guy that's you know um leading i want to say um not to say that you give your attention to that person more but um you that just kind of shows you like keep more eye contact with them maybe no no don't do that <laughs> definitely <laughs> that was singling now yeah you don't ignore everybody else but <laughs> no i just mean like oh uh, this make eye contact every now and then more than every you bitch it, because you have like okay the other members the one that's in charge a lot of times the, the person that's in charge really doesn't even 
you know, he's just leading it. But then you have others that are more concerned about the finances. You might have person a person that's concerned about the advertisement and stuff. You know, each and every, they all have their individual, like, concerns and stuff like that. And they'll just kind of keep quiet and hopefully you'll give them the answer they're looking for without have, without them having to ask. But um, a lot of times it's usually, like, one person that has all the questions for everybody else so they don't really have to speak they can <laughs> sit there like if you watch shark tank and i brought that up for a specific you watch shark tank it's the one dude the older guy um with the bald head he's the one running the show most of the time um but he's like also like the asshole of the show um <laughs> yeah, but if you, it's kind of like simon simon cowell and uh yeah American Idol back in the day he was the main one running it, even though there were three judges. Yeah. Um, not necessarily that that's what you're going to be looking for. Oh, he's the guy that, you know, is, uh, you know, you can kind of tell, like, who's running the operation. So basically just don't single him out, but, like, check every now and then to see if he looks interested. No, it's not even about that. It's, you know, you, you, you identify him. Okay, this is a person running. So that's the person you kind of want to sell it to. Um, if anybody else, because, you know, everybody else is listening and they're paying attention, but a lot of times they'll have their, you know, they won't even make, they won't make eye contact with you. They'll be taking a lot of notes and stuff like that. Um, it's the guy that's in, in charge that has the freedom to actually pay attention to what it is that you are, you know, and pay attention to your body language and all that good stuff. And he's the one that's normally going to guide the tone and in, in the direction it's going. Like he's going to ask you some questions that, you know, may make or break you um, while everybody else watches and takes their notes. Oh, his body language isn't, you know, he's not too confident in that just based off that question. Um, when you have one guy that's that's asking all the questions and, you know, it's kind of easy for the others to kind of, you know, stay outside of the box and, and, and just view you. You know, it's, it's weird. It's hard to explain it. But um, yeah, I get what you're saying, though. It's like somebody is going to be um kind of guiding and directing the way that the maybe like the question and answer portion of the pitch is going yeah, because I'm, they're going to be asking the certain question that leads into something else that'll be the same way if it's a pitch meeting there's always going to be like one executive or one main person in the room most of the time that is like you said they're going to ask the questions first the more important thing that they have on their mind and then everyone else is just there listening, which they might branch their questions off of that other person. Yeah. But if that first person didn't even ask anything, they might not even ask their question because they didn't think of it. It's like you said, they're taking notes and whatever else. So, you know, I mean, and it's not just to, to kind of say, oh, well, this guy, you know, but this is the person that you are pretty much trying to sell your pitch to. Not to say that this person is going to be like the make or break, but this is the person that you are selling to. So like you want to kind of give him some attention while equally giving everybody else the same amount of respect and eye contact. Um, <clears throat> because if you watch Shark Tank, um, a lot of times, I say about 90% of the times, it's not even about the product that's being pitched. Um, the questions they ask like have nothing to do. With, like, oh, you know, they'll, you, you know, you'll see them pitch the product and you, okay, they like it. Somebody's going to put an offer down and they don't put an offer down because of the way it was pitched. Um, because the questions that they ask have nothing to do. You know, the thing is, everybody, when they pitch, especially when they pitch to me, um, it's always, I get the same, oh, well, this is going to, you know, we're doing this proof of concept and then we're going to get funding and then we're going to hire you back to shoot the film. And it's like, you know, I've, I've heard that so many times. I, I don't care. About, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I just want to hear you say like, oh, you want me to do free work? And, you know, which is, you know, I'm not beneath, I'm not above that or anything to do free work. But what I am is like, at the same time, if I am working for free, I shouldn't have to come out of my pocket for anything. So like, you know, I shouldn't have to worry about um, locations or anything like all that stuff should be covered, you know. And a lot of people will come to me. It's like, oh, well, do you know any of these locations? It's like, no, nah, bro, <laughs> that's completely up to you. Like, that's, you know, up to you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're asking me to work for free. Um, you're not asking me, you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to come out of my pocket for your passion project or anything like that. 
but it's like the thing I'm always, I'm always running into people that are pitching me these ideas. And I'm just like, I, you know, I'm just a cinematographer. Like, I'm not, you know, I, I really don't care. You know, you're going about this the wrong way and you're pitching to the wrong guy. But um, yeah, those, those are the things that you need to look for. Like, okay, um, what, not necessarily uh, what makes your project different. You would think that that would be like, the, oh, what makes my movie different from anybody else's movie? The things they care about are um, what is what is your movie going to project for them as far as like uh, time slots, um, just having something that they can fill in for whatever it is, so that they can get they can. Get, I hate to say it, but it's all at the end of the day, it's about money, um, especially when you're talking about these executives. That's what it all boils down to is the whole artsy fartsy side of you know. <clears throat> everybody wanting oh i have this idea it's going to be this the next big friend they don't care about that stuff they just want to know um what your project can do as far as getting them Finance. but not even buzz just they need something that's going to fill that time slot. like let's say um i'll give you an idea the resident i just got done watching the resident evil um series on netflix <laughs> terribly but yes why bad. you didn't even need to watch to know that i think i think the reasoning why it flopped so bad was because the movie that came before it destroyed it <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> so it's kind of like if you're gonna say hey you like there's an evil movie why when we've already been down that road and been down that avenue um netflix choose to pick it up after the movie did so bad when you know if you go through netflix there's nothing on netflix right now um nothing like <laughs> nothing at all but they just need content um to fill you know that slot so that's really what it's coming down to is like hey um we have resident evil um, which already has a following, a backing, and some clout. Let's make this series. And even though it's probably going to not work, um, we're still going to get some kind of hits off of it just because it's... Res if you look, like, that's what the things are. That's what's happening right now. Resident Evil, uh, Chucky has a TV series. Supergirl has a TV series. Um, <clears throat> the Batwoman. Like, that's that's the thing. They're just... <clears throat> recycling stuff that's already been done and turning them into TV. Scream now has a TV series. I Know What You Did Last Summer has a TV series. They're just recycling stuff to fill in, you know, whatever void it is for their streaming service. So, and that's, that's what it all boils down to with these executives nowadays. It's like, what slot can you fill in for us on our streaming platform or on our television network or whatever our seasonal movie whatever what can you guys <laughs> bring to the table as far as that and can you meet whatever number or break even that's all they care about they don't care about oh i got the next star wars they they just don't <laughs> it's not even about that anymore <laughs> which is a sad thing yeah yeah, definitely. And it's like, like I was saying in the comments, your story may be great, but if it's not going to sell tickets or if it's not going to get an audience, if nobody's going to watch it on that time slot, then they don't care because it's not worth it. And there's there's so no reason for them to take it on because they are, like you said, they're all about money because they're the finance side of things. They're the business side. And so you have to, as an independent filmmaker, independent creator, you have to be on both. You have to be creative and business savvy because there's a lot of that those tactics that go into it you also need to like sarah said understand an emotional pulls can make a cinematic a movie cinematic and that sells um and that you can use in your marketing if you know what kind of again that goes with the target audience you know who's going to react to this how are they going to react to this who likes this kind of emotional pull and how can i utilize this moment in the film or how can i utilize this message to reach the people that are going to actually want to come see it um but yeah it's like it's 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 all about 
with the pitch fest, with the pitching to anybody, if you're pitching to investors, all they care about at the end of the day is, is this going to make me my money back? And is it going to make, does it have the chance to be profitable to get me more money? Yes, here. Um, I was going to add something there. I don't think that they only care about money. I just think that it is a very strong deriving factor. Now, a lot of creators and investors actually do care about different angles and different stories in different directions, but they have to care about money first because it's a business. And if they don't, well, the ship, ship will sink. And if the ship sinks, everyone's out of a job. It's like a horrible thing, right? Like, especially if they're selling and they're making movies all the time, they can have like a failure here and there, but like they, they can't really like afford to fail. So um, it has to be like huge on the like the radar, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they only care about money. Right. But like, like, like they I was saying, the, to, end, right? the end goal is, is going to be money. Um, yeah. The end of the, at the end of the day, it's, it's about money. Not saying well, that everything is about, not saying that everything is about money, but at the end of the day, at the end of the entire thing, they want to make sure that the money is there or that the possibility of the money is there so that they can get well, it. With an gotta... independent finance financier, then maybe they might care about, they might be a really rich person that is just interested in spreading a certain message and your film is giving that message. And so they might just want to spread that message no matter if it makes money or not. But that is a lot more rare than, like you said, an investor that maybe wants to spread the message, but, it, but their main goal is to make money because if they don't, then they can't keep investing in different films because they won't have any money to invest. So I agree with what you're saying um, and with what Brian was saying. Yeah, exactly. Brian? And that's also why they um, often ask people like, are you willing to put any of your money up front? Because this may or may not work and we don't want to take on all the risk. How much do you believe in your project too? Because we don't want to take a risk on someone that's going to be like die out halfway or something. That makes complete sense. I mean- right, And that is why like with crowdfunding campaigns, if you have a successful one, they're like, wow, people are willing to put money in just for the idea alone. And you have a following already. And that's why that is such a big draw for additional investment because they see there's an audience there that's willing to pay just for the idea of it. And so that's also like a... I've also seen companies back out just because they just don't want to have associations with a particular idea or project or whatnot. They don't want to tarnish their name. But as far as, as, as far as corporate greed goes and the way it is, like I said, just pay attention to everything that's going on. They're playing it safe. Like they're not, everybody's complaining about, oh, they're making the same movies over again because they're playing it safe. Um, every year we get Star Wars, we get Guardians of the Galaxy. You look on Netflix and like I just said about all these series that are coming out that are based off of classic iconic movies. Um, we were just talking uh, the last couple of meetings about the Disney factor, how they're just remaking live action movies of movies that have already been done. The yeah. work is already They all suck. I like the jungle book. <laughs> Fine, 99.9% .9 of them suck. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's not entirely true. I mean, it's just a matter of like, if you're seeing things, everyone's going to suck if you're like on the opposing sides. It's just like, I don't know. It's like, I say people suck when they like, oh, like, not explaining things or being difficult. Just I'm not talking people. about people. I'm talking about corporate greed when you remake a story with no soul, no heart, no anything just to make more money. That's it, what it, They've got cruised to. Yeah, it's, I, I have mixed feelings on that. Anyway, sorry, Brandon, what you say? I said it, it's you off? being safe. They need to make this margarine and make this whatever product they need to push um, so people will spend money on it or mm -hmm. for you know kids are going to want to see it so that's all it is it's just playing it safe we don't want to take the risk of doing something like sarah says that's for the better that's new that's fresh that hasn't been done before you know we want to kind of just stay monotone and stay in control it's corporate it's, it's greed i feel um, like it's also because this and this is my theory and i tell everyone this. wait before you say it, uh vish said studios also have investors they need to give money back to and those investors are sometimes interested in only one 
specific genre. That too, yeah. So I said, yeah, so sometimes it pays to play it safe. Risk needs to be thought out. That is so true with these companies. They have to have risk assessments and things, especially if they're a publicly traded company, they have to worry about stockholders. Even if they're not publicly traded, they have to worry about their finances. That, they have to. That was going to be my point. Go ahead. My point is, we. I've noticed this pattern that I feel like whenever the economy, especially, is in times where it's not great, companies play it safe even more. So there's a bigger fear of creativity or doing something different because tight financial times are already so hard. They're going to play it safe as much as they can. And I've just noticed that that's a pattern. Every time the economy is bad, it feels like these companies just try to play it safe as much as possible because they just want to make money and they want to make sure they don't lose money. Yeah, it, it's just, it, it is a bigger risk to do a project that is unknown, that is, you know, not an IP like Brian's talking about, and that <laughs> is something new and fresh. Even if it's a good idea, it's still a risk because they don't know if there's a built-in audience. Like they know there's a built-in audience for Marvel, Star Wars, or just, you know, whatever book series that came out that had a big following. So... It is a bigger risk for them, and films are risky already. Even if you make a film based on IP, like the Resident Evil series, it doesn't mean anybody's going to like it. It doesn't mean it's going to do well. It just means that you have a better chance of maybe doing well because there's already people that are going to watch it. Even if they don't like it, you have a bigger chance of getting people to see it. So the money is still there, and that's why a lot of these projects get made. Even though it sucks, there's a reason for it. Um, and yeah, that's why it's hard to pitch independent movies well, with unknown people with an unknown cast and crew that have small budgets. Or even if you're trying to get a bigger budget, it's hard to do it, especially if you're an unknown creator, because the ones that are known already, they have a hard enough time getting these projects made that they want to make. So there's a lot of steps to it. Like Sarah's saying in the comments, there's, there's tons of different aspects that you have to think about. That's why it's so difficult to make a film and, and also, why it's such a big when, when we're, uh, why it's such a big achievement to even finish a film for independent filmmakers yeah, because no, because it's hard to do from the start and if you can get that done that is already a great thing no matter what happens afterward um, but yeah go ahead Sarah I was gonna say and also like they could turn a project down because it has something in topic that does not resonate with their channel with what they're selling so i mean there's a lot of aspects to consider and they might not even like tell you so i mean sometimes it, it pays to go hey what what made you like feel free to like ask the question what is the number one reason why you're rejecting this and then you either know i right away oh we didn't like how it's written or this doesn't support our channel or it could be a quick answer and they might not even answer but at least then you know you give that like a uh, thing too because it's also nice like too like you might have you know 10 different horror channels um say this is an example and like one turns it down but you might ask another one because it is a good pitch and it is a good movie and you believe on it and the first one says no well i mean and you're pitching for horror, so you're gonna look into it and be like oh well maybe the nuances of like the detail for on this channel isn't exactly matching up with the the stylistic choices that we're selling so if you go over to a channel that's selling something more stylistically in line even though it's the same genre you might have a better or like the same underlying themes or messages you might have a better time selling it so the, that's huge yeah definitely and, and i would say that's why like at these pitch fest if you go to one it's so good especially like you said to maybe ask a question they might not answer you they might just be like oh it just didn't work for us which you know obviously is too vague for you to do anything with but if they actually say well, it's because of this thing, then you can alter your pitch and you can pitch, now you're pitching to the next person, but you're altering it with that new feedback you got. And that's the same thing, whether you're going to pitch meetings, whether you're going to pitch fests or just pitching with your elevator pitches. If you get feedback, pay attention, pay attention to what they didn't like about the pitch itself. Was it the script? Was it the characters? Was it your pitch, the way you delivered it? You know, well, yeah. You have something to say? Oh, but um, the, uh, was the way you delivered it, whatever it is, you can alter your pitch and, and change the way you pitch to the next person so you have a better chance. 
And like Sarah said, you might know, you, there might be like slight nuances you don't understand. Like Brian said, the company might like it until they see a certain thing that you have in there and they'd be like, oh, we don't want to associate ourselves with this kind of message. Um, or, you know, if you have something very drastic or very uh, controversial that happens in your script, like John Wick had the dog. Well, this is a spoiler. If you haven't seen John Wick, John Wick, the dog gets killed. And so, you know, if if you're one of if you're pro pets, you might not be for that, even if you like the rest of the film. And they're like, oh, we're not going to take that out because that's important to the story. Just because it's a good story and it adds a, a reason for him to do all the stuff he does, doesn't mean that that specific company is going to agree with it and, and be willing to produce something with that kind of content in it. And so, like Sarah said, just because they do action films, maybe, that doesn't mean necessarily they would do an action film that has a dog get killed. Um, or, you know, they might do it more because it's something different and compelling, but you'll never know. You'll generally never really know. And, and I always say it doesn't hurt to like do a proper ask. I mean, I wouldn't spam somebody endlessly and I would think it out and I would be like a proper ask. Be like, hey, la la la, this is why I'm interested. This is what I'm interested in. Um, yeah, and then, and then see a proper ask and a no today doesn't mean a no tomorrow, but you might not want to go to the same person 10 times in the same week or like, right? So you're just like, oh, okay, no problem. You might work on another project, you know, for the next year and then you never know who you'll meet again and maybe like you have something else or the, your ideas or, or um, projects line up or something else. Yeah, so yeah. And not everyone is exactly 100% like upfront about everything that they do. Some people are um, too. So I mean, like it's always good to have like some caution, but I mean, you know, don't beat yourself up either if like things don't always go 100% smooth because they don't always. Right. And, and you'll never, you might not know why, or you might be told why, but usually they'll just be left in the dark. So don't just think, oh, I suck because there's multiple variables to why something might not work out. <laughs> um, the last thing I'll say is on Thursday, we are going to be talking about market research a little bit. We've kind of gone over some of that stuff already, but um, talk about that. Film marketing tips and advice, pitching with a log line and a synopsis. So the log line and synopsis, we'll talk about that a little bit more. We've talked about it before, so we'll see how much detail we go in. And then taglines, how to make one, what they are and how to make one that's catchy. Um, does anyone else have anything to say or add before we say good night? Yeah. All right, appreciate everybody for coming. Hope you guys have a good <laughs> few days of your week and hope to see you all back Thursday. Bye guys. All right. Good night.